for leading us, and hello again. Good morning. Let me just say a word of prayer. Father, thank you uh, for this gathering this morning, for bringing us together, to look at your word as you come to speak to us. Father, over the last few weeks, we've been digging into this and, and studying this book of James that we and we thank you for it. We thank you for the letter that you have preserved by your Holy Spirit, written not to us, but for us. And Father, as we take one last look at it, uh, looking back at it, we just pray that you would continue to minister to us, minister to our souls through these ancient words that are alive for us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, so what we're going to do this morning is uh, just take one last look, kind of a uh, I look back at the book of James and kind of pick up some highlights and, and just, uh, I just wanted to have really just one final reflection, a final thoughts, my final thoughts anyway, on this wonderful book. Um, but I also want to give you some ideas of what's going to happen for the next few weeks. So next week being down at the waterfront, um, I'll be preaching actually this time, uh, but I'll be kind of sliding into the series that uh, that Cornerstone is doing. So we're going to be looking at one of the Gospels. And then the week after, Shane is going to share with us uh, on the 28th of August. And then that brings us into September. And um, in a meeting we had a few weeks ago uh, with, with members of the worship team and others, um, we talked about maybe we should get into the Old Testament a little bit. So we're going to spend some time in the book of Jeremiah uh, starting in September. So that's what's coming up in the weeks ahead. But like I said, I'd love to, the, to today just uh, have a final reflection and thoughts on the book of James. And I want to begin by just thinking about James himself and what I think that we felt, what we experienced through the book of James is that James has a very, uh, very much a pastoral heart. James is a pastor to us, has been a pastor to us over these three weeks. Now, James, in the Bible, in the Gospels, or, or in the book of, um, sorry, in, in the epistles, the apostle Paul names him as an apostle, a fellow apostle. James is a fellow apostle, and then we find out in Acts chapter 15 at the Council of Jerusalem that James is very much a leader of the church, but even in this famous Council of Jerusalem, we see James acting very pastorally. The Council of Jerusalem, if you remember it, is this uh, situation where um, Peter, as well as Paul and Bar Barnabas, are coming to Jerusalem, seeking direction around, around what to do in regards to how God is working among the Gentiles and bringing the Gentiles to faith. And how do Jews and Gentiles interact? And what kind of, what do we expect of the Gentiles? It was really the question. And James, uh, you know, who, who we recognize as being the leader, uh, basically stands up at the end and he says, we are not going to ask anything too hard of the Gentiles. We're not going to ask, a.k.a. Uh, we're not going to ask them to be circumcised. But then he says other things. He says, for example, we're only, only going to ask a couple of things of them. We're going to ask that they um, avoid sexual immorality. Well, that's, that's a message for all of us as Christians, for the whole church, and particularly the church out in the areas of, of Antioch under Roman influence, where sexual immorality was rampant. And then he says, we're going to ask that they avoid you know, certain foods, which sounds like he's adding a rule. But really, pastorally, what James is saying is, my heart's desire is to see Jews and Gentiles at the table together. My heart's desire is that we not build tall fences, but that we extend the table. And if we could just ask you Gentiles to avoid certain foods because the Jewish people have certain food laws, then we can sit down at the table together. It's this beautiful pastoral picture that James has of the, of the church, the Jews and the Gentiles eating together. And so this is James for us. He is a pastor, and we've experienced him as a pastor. I've made reference to this over the few weeks that we were going through the book, that many times, 11 times that I counted, James speaks to his, to his readers as my dear brothers and sisters, over and over again. Brothers and sisters, my dear brothers and sisters. This is James speaking to us, and he's speaking to us. He's inviting us as a church to be family to one another as brothers and sisters. And when he doesn't call, uh, when he doesn't use the term brothers and sisters, it's because he's speaking bold and harsh words to those who are oppressing the poor. So James, pastorally again, 
out of concern for the marginalized, uh, avoids the term brothers and sisters, but instead is speaking very, you know, very strongly to those who are the oppressors. Well, that's the work of a pastor, isn't it? To speak out and to speak in care and concern. We have been pastored by James so well over these weeks. And what we have um, uh, come to understand and, and emphasized over the last number of weeks is that there are three recurring themes in the books of, book of James. Trials, wisdom, and riches. And so as we continue kind of taking a re retrospective look at the back of book of James, I want to just camp on each of these th three themes for a few minutes. And so we'll begin with this uh, a final kind of reflection on the uh, subject of trials. And if, with, each, with each one, I'm just going to read one verse. So James 1 and 2. This is one of the scriptures that we memorized early on. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James is giving us a theology of suffering. And in a world that is pain avoidant, in a world where, um, where there's a desire to flee from, from anything that looks like suffering or pain and just seek comfort and seek our own individual leisure and comfort, we need to have a theology of suffering. James is not suggesting that we seek pain. James is not suggesting that we, we refuse the alleviation of pain. If you get a headache, take a Tylenol. James is instead saying that it's compassionate to want to alleviate suffering. This is, you know, the Christians are known to alleviate the suffering of those who have been left behind at different times in church history and in the history of the world. But in our world of pursuit, in, in our world of the pursuit of pleasure and comfort, the avoidance of suffering has become a god. This is the world that we live in. And this is very much evident in Canada in, in the um, legislation that we know as MAID, Medically Assisted Dying. Medically Assisted Dying was covered very well um, recently in Faith Today. Faith Today is a Christian Canadian publication. And they were looking at this, this topic of medically assisted dying and um, helping us understand and really exposing that society is very much moving in the direction. Obviously, it's, it's in our legislation and it's been amended even to kind of expand it and increase the, uh, the accessibility of this act of mercy killing or mercy killing or euthanasia. And this is the world that we're living in. And so they were reminding us of this. And um, what we see is that, um, is that there's just an increased ease and comfort around this, an increased acceptance that this is a compassionate thing to do. It's understood and framed as an act of compassion. Well, I want to read to you um, a quote from a, a doctor, a surgeon named William Robert Nielsen, uh, who wrote in the Canta Canadian Journal of Bioethics. Uh, Nielsen would be a proponent of MAID, but this was his observation. He says, MAID will lose the status as a last-ditch intervention for uncontrollable pain in imminently dying patients. Sick people will begin to see themselves as easily erasable and as excess human specimens. And then this last line I think we have up on the slide. He says, the conviction that it is a wonderful and divine thing to exist will be hollowed out by notions of a life that strives for societal convenience. This is a scary thought, isn't it? That this notion that people will feel like they need to choose this path for, for, the, for the good of society, for societal convenience, is a scary path that we're heading down. And the church needs to have a voice. Now, we are existing on the margins of society. We're not making the laws. We exist over here. But we, as a church, as the collective church, need to have a voice that talks about a theology of suffering, that talks about suffering differently than what the, the way the world talks about it. A theology of suffering says that God can redeem our suffering. God can still be at work in the midst of our suffering. That there can be a spark of light even in the midst of the deepest darkness. That we can experience goodness even in the midst of our deepest pain and suffering and the trials that we are going through. That God is still at work. 
and that all human beings have an innate dignity and deserve life and need to be treated with compassion to the end of life. This is a theology of suffering. Now, James says joy, that we're to have joy in the face of trials, in the face of suffering. So the question is, well, where does joy come in? Well, I like what Eugene Peterson says. Eugene Peterson, in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, he says that joy has a history. This is a beautiful idea that joy has a history. I'm going to read to you uh, from Psalm 126. He bases this idea off of Psalm 126. Psalm 126 is one of the Psalms of the Ascents. So these were the Psalms that uh, pilgrims would have been reading or singing together as they were ascending to worship in Jerusalem. Psalm 126 says, When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. The pilgrims, as they were ascending to Jerusalem, are remembering the, the work that God has done to bring the people of Israel out of, uh, out of exile. That God has worked in this way. But they also crying out because they're continuing to suffer, that the whole work of restoration is not complete. It seems like perhaps the city was restored, but when Babylon came in and sacked Jerusalem, they, they, they destroyed all the surrounding area as well. And it seems like that whole work of restoration was, was not complete. And so the people are singing out, they're looking back and saying, look what God has done. God has restored us. God has brought us back into the promised land. He has restored the city of Jerusalem, but we are longing for more. There is more to be done, and so we are looking ahead to see what God will do, even in the midst of our ongoing suffering. They are looking back and finding hope in the stories of God's restoration. Joy has a history. We experience joy in the midst of our suffering because we can look back and see what God has done. And so as part of our theology of suffering and the experience of joy in the midst of suffering, we need to be collecting the stories of what God has done in our lives, in our, in our community, and in our midst. How has God been at work? How has God brought about healing? We need to collect these stories and fill our minds with them. How has God provided for us? How has God provided for you in the past? and cling to those, and know that God will continue to provide for us in the midst of suffering. God will redeem it. God will continue to be. There will be sparks of light in the midst of the darkness. So that's the first verse I wanted to look at. The second verse I want to look at is James 3, 8. So we've looked at uh, you know, the first theme of trials. The second theme that was common uh, through the book of James is the theme of wisdom, particularly wisdom as it relates to our words and the use of our words. So James 3.8 says, But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. There's, there's a whole chapter there, we know, or a portion of a chapter about taming the tongue. And this one word, this one verse, I think really captures the heart of that, that passage. The, the tongue, it's, it's, it's got great potential for, for good, for building up, but it's got great potential for tearing down and for hurting. And we need to be careful, particularly around using the tongue to, uh, as a form of judgment. Jesus warns us not to judge others. And the tongue, when used in judgment, what does it do? It drives people away. When we are judging others, we are driving them away. And it is easy to judge. Uh, and when we think about, um, when we think about this, the, the, the situation of, of MAID, we've talked about the medically assisted dying. When we think about that, it's easy for us as Christians to say, we disagree so strongly that we are going to judge those who think differently about this. Or perhaps even judge those who pursue this path of medically assisted dying. But when we do that, when we judge people 
in any way, we are breaking the opportunity for relationship with them. We are putting up a fence, not extending a table of conversation and love and grace. We lose the opportunity to be present with people. I love how Faith Today, in their, and as they were covering this topic, were um, interviewing people who are caregivers in palliative care homes, Christians who are doing group work or individual work with people who are at, towards the end of their life, and how they struggled with this if some people in their, in their care would choose this path. And they realized that they had a decision to make. They could judge that decision and then therefore cut off relationship with that person. Or they could say, no, I don't agree with this decision, but I'm going to journey with you to the end of your life. I'm going to journey with you even as you choose a path that I don't agree with. Judgment blocks that opportunity. Choosing to not judge, but to try to understand the decisions that people are making, being open about your feelings about it, but still following alongside, allows you the opportunity to minister, allows us the opportunity to minister to people, even in the midst of a situation of disagreement. As one person said, who uh, was interviewed in the Faith, Faith Today article, a caregiver said, to leave them alone. And many of these people have no one in their life at such a time would seem unconscionable. It would seem unconscionable to leave people alone, to say, I don't agree with the path that you're choosing. I'm not going to be a part of your life and minister to you any longer. Judgment drives people away. It breaks the opportunity for ongoing relationship. And for us to be able to live out the gospel and share the gospel, we need to do that in relationship. We need to do that in people's presence. So does this mean we need to agree with people? No, but we need to understand others. We need to understand where people are coming from and the decisions that people are making. Does it mean we need to be soft on our convictions? Again, no, but it's learning how to communicate those things and remembering that, um, that the important thing for us is staying in relationship with others who disagree with us in order that, or who are taking, making decisions that we disagree with, in order that we can continue to be in relationship and live out the gospel in their midst and to present the gospel to them. Thinking about this as a, as a church, whether it's a question of people who are choosing made or just other people in other situations who are making decisions that we don't agree with, what do we do as a church? I think understand one of the, the calls in this article is about understanding that we can create a new social reality for people who are making decisions that, uh, that maybe we don't understand or agree with, uh, particularly around this issue of medically assisted dying. It's, there are people who are living in extreme loneliness and isolation. So why not, as a church, be alongside people and create a reality for them where they don't experience that, where we can welcome them in and be part of their lives to demonstrate to them what it means to care for others and to allow others to care for us. This is what it means to be a church. When I was in Ontario, I was part of a ministry that was uh, reaching out and, and welcoming um, uh, people who were living on the margins of society, particularly low-income people. We were situated alongside a well-known food bank when we first opened up our doors. And there was one woman who used to come in. And this woman was a young mother, and she was, she was alone. And she was a little bit angry. <laughs> and she had a countenance about her that kind of kept people away. And it would have been easy just to, to judge her and say, you're angry, <laughs> you're unapproachable, I don't want to be part of your life. You can come in, you can have a seat, but I'm going to keep my distance. You seem to be wanting me to keep distance from you. But the people, the staff, and the volunteers there chose not to do that. They reached out in love and compassion. They didn't judge her for her, for her presentation, but they broke through the walls that she was building in order to live out and be in her presence and to present the gospel to her and draw her into relationship with Christ, which is what eventually happened in her life. And as you saw this unfold over years, it was this beautiful thing of this woman having the walls break down, being receptive to the gospel, because she wasn't judged, but she was welcomed. 
even though she was presenting in a way that would have been easy to judge otherwise. James 3.18, the final verse I'd like to just look at, says, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And again, this was a verse that we looked at that was, uh, that, that we had, um, that was part of our memory work, the second part of our memory work. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. It's good to remember that this letter uh, that, that James wrote was written to uh, churches who were scattered around Jerusalem in the areas outside of Jerusalem, particularly around areas of Syria, modern-day Syria, Turkey, and Iraq, and that these um, Christians were likely scattered due to the persecution. Some, uh, some um, Bible scholars would point back to the stoning of Stephen and say that these churches uh, were, were churches that were planted and established after the, after the stoning of Stephen and the Christians scattered to the other areas. And so this is where the churches, these are some of the, these would then be our roots. These would be the earliest churches going back, obviously, hundreds and thousands of years. And these churches were um, largely, as we found out as we studied James, that these were made up of poor people, largely poor people, some of them experiencing oppression by, by the rich. Uh, whether it be other rich Christians in their congregation or rich landowners who weren't part of the congregation. But these were people who were experiencing some form of oppression. And James is calling them to be peacemakers. In the midst of your oppression, James is calling you as the poor in the face of the rich to be peacemakers. This is a, a strong calling uh, for people who are under oppression to be the ones to initiate peace. Well, I think what I'm intrigued by this book, uh, The Last Christians, is that um, it's telling the story of the churches that exist in these areas that these churches that James was writing to. So these churches that James was writing to and the message of being peacemakers has, has, um, has taken root in them. And thousands of years later, we can see that these same Christians are seeking to be peacemakers. Let me just read to you an excerpt from the book. So the context here is that um, Christians in the Middle East, in Syria and Iraq in 2015, were uh, fleeing their area because of the ISIS coming in and taking over cities and taking over regions and being pushed out, uh, being persecuted, terrorized, leaving. And the context here is that there's a, a man ministering to, to these refugees in Germany where he lives. And um, some of them were staying in a refugee settlement area. And so he talks about going to pay a visit to the, to the Protestant convent where these refugees were being housed and staying. So he says, A few days later, I pay another visit to the Protestant convent. Miriam, one of the, one of the refugee women, and her sister-in-law have prepared a Middle Eastern supper as a token of thanks to the nuns and myself. Before the meal is served... Fatty, and Fatty, again, is a, is a refugee uh, Christian man out of the Middle East, out of Syria. Fatty proposes a game he has prepared as an icebreaker. He says, this is the game. There are two different hats. All the Germans take a piece of paper from the red hat, and all the Syrians take a piece of paper from the black one. Written on each piece of paper in both German and Arabic is one half of a Bible verse, such as, blessed are the meek, or do not repay evil with evil. And the object, uh, the object of the game is to find the person with the other half of the Bible verse. The German-Syrian pair then discuss their Bible quotation and say something about it to the group at the end in their two languages. It proves to be a great way of getting us into conversation despite our linguistic difficulties as we muddle through with much hand-waving. The girls have already had a few English lessons back in Aleppo, which helps to oil the wheels of communication. When the buzz of chatter dies down, we return to the circle, and I read the complete verse in German. The verse is, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Then Miriam reads it in Arabic, and we both sum up in a couple of sentences what our quotation means to us before listening to the verses and commentaries of the others. Recognizing a pattern in these verses Fadi has chosen, I grow thoughtful. 
All these verses are about forgiveness, nonviolence, and loving one's enemies. These people have just lost a husband, a father, and uncle to terrorists, and have been robbed of their home and possessions, and yet instead of uttering words of revenge or retaliation, here they are quoting words of peace from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It amazes me that people who have suffered such terrible violence can still pray for their enemies and speak of forgiveness. This message of peace has taken root. This is a beautiful picture, isn't it? James wrote this letter 2,000 years ago to these Christians, telling them to be peacemakers. And here we are in 2022 reading about Christians in 2015 who are seeking to be peacemakers, who are being oppressed by these terrorists. And their response is peace. So what is our experience when we find ourselves being persecuted in some way or being whether <laughs> we may not be, be, be being terrorized in this way but when we're when we are hurt by people what is our response are we going to love them back are we going to forgive them or do we want to take revenge whether it's with our words or our lack of words sometimes we feel like we're justified in just making a point we're going to avoid this person who's hurt us we're going to make them pay for it there are subtle ways that we seek to take revenge that we need to be cautious of and aware of that these things can kind of creep into our lives and say, I'm taking it upon myself to seek revenge in this situation. The promise that James makes in this verse is a promise of righteousness. The peacemaker will so... What is the... Oh, I lost the, the verse there. But the promise is righteousness. And what is Righteousness. Righteousness is right relationships. When we seek to make peace, we will restore relationships back to their right place. Revenge doesn't do that. Revenge just further breaks the relationship. Peace has the potential to restore relationships. James, in his pastoral letter to us, gives us these three things. He reminds us about grace, he reminds us about love, and he reminds us about peace. The cross, the cross of Jesus, is an instrument of, of torture, but it is for us something that is abounding in grace, love, and peace. The cross is abounding in grace because it is this gift that we don't deserve. The cross is abounding in love because God redeemed us out of his immense love for us. Out of his immense love for us, God reached out and redeemed us through the work of his son Jesus on the cross. And the cross represents peace because Jesus, because God, through Jesus, has brought us back into right relationship with him through the cross. Grace, love, and peace. God has made a way for us back to him. With that in mind, let's take together the bread and the wine. I'm going to ask you and invite you to take it along with me. So we'll open up, hold the wafer in your hand. And I say to you, the body of Christ broken for you, take and eat. And as we peel back this juice representing the blood of Jesus, let's remember this is for us, the blood of Jesus poured out for us for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. Father, we thank you for your, for your holy word. We thank you for the book of James, which speaks to us grace, love, and peace your great grace, your great love, your great peace made possible through the cross. Thank you for the blood and the body and the sacrifice of Jesus for our sake. May we live lives that honor you, that go into the world with grace, love, and peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And invite Elaine and the worship team one more time.
we just thank you that you are there with us and that we don't have to go through these things alone, that you are there. And that with your strength and your power and your love and your grace, that we can do those things that you have asked us to do. Father, that we would step out and, and love and care and compassion and understanding would be our strengths. Father, we pray for a week of safety and joy and blessings for each and every one here and online. Father, we pray for those things for our families and our friends that are, are unsure of where they are in their relationship with you. And Father, I know those are heavy on some of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we would ask those that are staying for the blessing um, to come to the front. And for those that are not, just to quietly meet out in the foyer and say hi and share the joy. <laughs>